Welcome to the five essential security practices every manufacturing executive should know, sponsored by Belta Technology. Today, we're joined by two of Belta Technologies industry leaders, Jim Cook, COO of Service Delivery, who brings almost three decades of IT and CIO experience with companies like Jockey International, Rawlings Sporting Goods, and other global organizations. We're also joined by Jay Flatterjohn, who oversees client engagement. He spent his entire career in the industrial space helping companies with their digital transformation journeys and solving their enterprise-wide business challenges. He brings over 25 years of OT, IT global experience with companies such as Rockwell Automation, Siemens, and Cisco. Yeah, we're up to me. And so before we get started, a couple of housekeeping things for all of us. So the content we're sharing will be approximately 30 to 45 minutes with time for Q&A. Please submit questions through the chat throughout the webinar, and they'll go privately to the presenters to be answered at the end. And we are recording the webinar so you can receive a copy via email. So we hope you enjoy the webinar. Let's get started. Take it away, Jim. All right. Thanks, Lou. I just a uh, real quick one at the mention who we are with Velta Technology. We're a service organization providing solutions for safe, secure, and efficient operations in the manufacturing and industrial digital world. We provide the software, the tools, the platforms, industrial appliances, and the essential know-how to properly protect your operations from the concrete to the cloud. And I want to today uh, extend a welcome and a thank you to everyone joining us over their lunch hour today and those of us watching now and uh, watching the recording later who weren't able to join us live. Um, taking a look at all the people that are pouring in, um, I want to welcome our current and prospective clients as well as those joining even across the globe today who are here to gain the latest insights that from our Belta technology perspective and our expertise around digital safety and cybersecurity, particularly in relation to this industrial and manufacturing environment. We believe, and I, I you'll, hopefully you'll see this throughout, um, that the industry is underserved and we're happy to work directly with clients one-on-one -on -one and with those other organizations that are um, uh, joining in to see what this is about. Uh, and, and we're ready to join forces with those organizations uh, who are interested in partnering and providing security solutions around the manufacturing and industrial security. And real quick before we get in, a special shout out to those uh, out there who know me personally uh, to learn a little bit more about what I've been working on and are just as interested to find out what I'm going to say as I am. So with that, <laughs> Let's uh, get into what we're covering today. We're into the slide, right? Um, it, it, it's about your target. I mean, the, the target, is, target is changing and it's you, right? It's everybody. Uh, there is a visibility challenge out there in the industrial environment. There's blind spots everywhere. Um, manufacturers, right? Every manufacturer embrace lean. So how can you take cybersecurity and make that lean? And the surprises are in cyber security insurances. And sometimes uh, they're not good surprises. Well, mostly they're not good surprises uh, when it comes down to it at the end of the day. And the last on the list, digital responsibility. It's something that uh, I've been preaching for quite some time. Uh, it's a business responsibility. And that business responsibility includes cybersecurity. So those are the things that we're going to cover. And I'm going to start with the last first. Right, the last first here, and if you walk away from this session with one thing, it's this. Ask this question, right? Some might answer it, right? Some might answer it, say yes, without really knowing why it's yes. How do you know? Um, we know the answer is likely no. I mean, our experience over the years here, um, I, I don't know if we've even had a client that was correct when they said yes. And after this session, hopefully you'll be able to begin to understand why we believe it's no and why it's critical to start addressing uh, addressing now. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide, right? And these are the big ones. 
wire target. But I want to open with just some uh, current events here. So remember, it's a new world out there. And if you've been following the GameStop phenomenon today, uh, it can happen fast and swift. And you don't want to be on the wrong end when certain uh, elements converge with the past few years. If anything, we learned about COVID, COVID's like digital transformation, dog years. It is uh, one year crammed in, or five years crammed into one, just everything that went on. And we're seeing that now, we're seeing that today as we speak. So what we've done is pulled together five different areas that you may not have heard about, some you may have, but what we feel are the signals that say the change is upon us when we're in this space, right? So uh, solar winds, everybody's heard of it. Um, it's a slide ahead. We're not going to get real technical. Um, those of you know me, I, I, you know, I'm wading in dangerous waters when I get real deep. But uh, <laughs> but we're going to talk about what it means, right? Now the second one, the e cans. It's not Pokemon. Took me a while to figure this one out, but through our research going through last year, ECANs get to know that if you are a manufacturer, if you're in the industrial environment, it is the stuck net of our time, right? ECANs, it's 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 a I think it's supposed to be a scare. It's, it's snakes spelled backwards in Pokemon, but it's a ransomware, right? Specifically targeting manufacturing industrial environments. It is a ransomware, the first of its kind. That was a for profit ever. The for profit that targeted ICS functionality specifically. It went out and was looking for certain ICS and in manufacturing industrial environment controls systems to shut them down as part of its ransomware. And it's the first. And it's in 2020. So 2020 keeps on giving, right, folks? It's it is e cans and, and we found this and and as we're put, doing our research and saying, this is very real. And once it's for profit, you know how these things work. Uh, the other thing that 2020 keeps on getting, uh, government alerts. Uh, those of you, some of you might know the answer to this because you probably talked to me recently, but there were 38 government alerts issued by CISA, the, uh, uh, the controlling government for cyber and uh, cybersecurity for the nation, like FBI and Homeland Security, they all roll up and it's, it, it is responsible to issue alerts when it sees active activity, ongoing activity that's a very real threat. There were 38 issued in the year 2020. I'll give you one guess on how many were in 2019. Five. There were only five. So there were only five. We went from five to, to, to 38 in one year, 2020. And, and I mean, that, just the activity alone it caused some pause. And not only that, one of those 38 was the first ever alert issued specifically for ICS functionality, automation controls, all those things that we'll be talking about today, all those things that if you're a manufacturer in your industrial plant, you have those things in your environment. And we're not done there when we talk about the government impact. Uh, there was a law passed in 2020 that, that actually is creating standards and enforcing standards for equipment if you're contracting with government entities. So now there's actually laws in place, and it's a law in 2020. Uh, um, and not to mention there's hundreds and hundreds, this is the same organization for hundreds and hundreds of vulnerabilities that are likely um, still remain today unpatched. So that's government and, and uh, betting on it. What I mean by betting on it is big companies are out there pouring big money in this. There are companies that know, the ones in the know and the ones with cash, they're pouring big money going, this is the next wave of uh, the, the cybersecurity. This is happening now. Let's get on it and touch on that in a few minutes. And of course, manufacturers pay. I mean, manufacturers, think about manufacturers, that's their cash register. Not producing, how can you make any money? Uh, so you're going to pay, you get caught, uh, you, you're going to pay or you're, you're going to pay one way or the other. You're going to pay them or you're going to pay on the back end and with, with whatever your pain is. And you, you got to get operational in the manufacturer. So all those things rolled in together. Oh, wait, whoa, I didn't even, I got, I have one little uh, chat request. So I'm going to show my age uh, here with this reference, but I call this slide right here, 
the Danger Will Robinson slide, right? So you're free to put in the chat if you know where Danger Will Robinson came into, but uh, <laughs> well, we'll come back to that later. But that's it to me, that's his danger, right? Danger Will Robinson, these things are real. Okay, let's go on to the next slide real quick. And uh, we're gonna, like I said, we're gonna touch on solar winds. Uh, and, and I won't get into a technical breakdown. There's a lot of information out there on the, the detail and what you need to do. We have a client that's using some of our tools um, that were, that had solar winds, and they're using our tools. They changed it just so they could put it over in the area uh, that is affected and has solar winds, so they can uh, uh, create some visibility and help mitigate that. But you know, what does that mean, right? What, let's examine what it means for businesses, right? You know, who was it meant for? It, it was meant for the high value targets, right? Well, we know that it was going after those government entities. Uh, but there were many more caught up, hundreds caught up. And the final number still isn't in. So if you were using solar winds, you got caught up, you got swept up. Uh, you were the soft target in the high target uh, purview. You're the casualty of war in that case, right? Uh, and that's why you're, it's ind indiscriminate. You're caught in the crossfire. These things are going on. Um, and, and this data collection piece, it's about the ability to collect info on your system. That's what this one was doing. That's what they potentially have information about your systems if you were using solar winds. And it's an advanced form of attack where they call, some call it the preparation phase, right? You get in there, you, you got to look and see what's around before you go into attack and figure out how to attack a subject, right? And, and it, it's, it, it could potentially be preparation for a direct attack uh, for anyone that was caught in that net. And the last one, you know, it was invisible. Uh, you've heard the term supply chain, right? It rode on things that were approved in your environment already. These were established paths. So uh, it, it went right past everyone's uh, existing cybersecurity defenses. So what are you supposed to do? It was, it was, it was invisible. So these, these things are changing. So let's go on to the next one, right? Uh, we get asked all the time, right? Okay, I heard the ransomware, but is it really happening in an industrial environment? Is it really happening with our industrial networks, right? Well, there's one, uh, um, uh, one example I'm going to use here that ties all the pieces, all those signals that we were talking about, I was talking about earlier together, and it was the 2020 Honda plant shutdown. There were multiple plant shutdowns for weeks. And you can, it's, it's online, this is public knowledge. Now, you have to piece all the things together to really uh, see it and dig into it because what the, the, the multi-plant shutdown, they were, they were infected and, and it impacted and shut down their operations in more than one plant for weeks. And it was the e -Kings, right? Which was a for-profit, ransomware target now who knows how they solved it um th that wasn't said but that was essentially what was uh diagnosed into occurring at honda right so now you got it actually happening in an environment e cans in play the government alert practically outlines the very specific things that were going on uh within e cans around the time and even updated later as opposed to, as a couple months ago around this manufacturing was the target right and the thing to, to even think about when you go well okay but that was honda that we, we don't see it all the time well if you read honda and what they had to disclose it was the disclosures everything was shut down don't worry uh no P pii no personally identifiable information nobody's social security or credit cards that's all they had to disclose right and then, you know, in, in the back, they have to say, okay, we were hit by something and, and, and it shut us down for a couple of weeks. So uh, that's something to think about because, uh, you know, many more are happening. We're talking to others. This is happening, but you, the disclosures are limited. You don't, you're not doing PII and you don't have to disclose this. And, and the other thing to keep in mind, those tracking services that are out there saying, well, what's the activity? They're all saying it's increasing as, as they are here on this slide. So I kind of, you know, back to the group. Are you guys ready to kind of join me in this uh, uh, chant of danger, Will Robinson? This stuff's very real, right? <laughs> These are signals. These are coming. So um, here's a few uh, companies, I think, that are uh, pretty recognizable. Some maybe not, but they're all taking action in some way 
I should say companies and organizations since we have the government up there. Uh, they're all taking action in a very uh, uh, big way against this very real threat. Okay, and and, and the, there are top worldwide manufacturers that are addressing this, right? You see the Coke and the AV and uh, and uh, they're out there. There there are many more. These are these are ones that we could use. And um, the major and there's also major investing in into big money into stopping creating these stopping capabilities. Um, uh, uh, Cisco is there, and and the other big names. They're creating and buying. Well, they're not so much current. They're they're creating a consolidation and they're buying these capabilities because they know it's important to this. This is coming. The trends are coming. Uh, all the signals are pointing to it. And, and now there's some big players emerging into the space to really specifically address. Uh, so I'm going to pause here uh, for a moment uh, to my esteemed colleague, uh, uh, Jim, <laughs> and the other Jim, Jim here, and uh, you know, ask him to to kind of chime in from his perspective because of his, his, you know he's been living this life for for decades. Yeah, I appreciate it, Jim. You know, Larry, if you could go back uh, to that slide, um, just so I could add a little bit of color to that particular slide. Um, you know, it, it, it's really interesting, uh, and I want to hit on a few things that Jim said, coming kind of from that OT perspective. You know, Jim's on the IT side, and I'm on the OT side. It, and this has really been kind of a new space. You know, all these companies are really trying to figure out how are they going to have some play into that industrial slash OT space. You know, uh, Cisco's made acquisitions, you know, Rockwell, Schneider, Siemens, they've made investments. Microsoft's now made investments with buying CyberX. Um, I've actually had conversations with the Department of Homeland Security. They have a whole group that was created probably about six years ago that, that focuses purely on industrial control systems or ICS, if you hear that term. So there's a, there's a lot of things that are going on and consolidation as people are really trying to look at this and it's changing from a an IT only type conversation to an enterprise wide conversation and how do companies have the tools that are available to be able to look at this on an enterprise wide business challenge. So um, as you guys are, are having these kinds of conversations realize there's a lot happening behind the scenes as companies are trying to gain better tool sets because it is a different type of tool set to be able to provide that visibility to those industrial assets that your standard IT tools are just not efficient at getting. So that I just wanted to add that color, Jim. Yep. Thanks, Jim. The Jim show. Jim one, Jim two. All right. So now, as I said before, where are your blind spots? Uh, we're not going to go into the, all the deep in the in the graphics here, but uh, these are three of the top security frameworks, right? You might hear all the, the the noise about what framework are you following? Well, there's the NIST, there's the CIS controls, the high trust approach. So I'm not going to go into the detail, but I, what, what this slide is to do is it's really for you to think about calling out the first. What is very common, no matter what approach or framework that you're using, identify. Each one of those identify first step because you can't protect what you can't see, right? So, you know, most research says that threats are inside an organization weeks, if not, I, I don't remember the exact quote off the top of my head, but weeks, uh, if not months, before they're discovered, right? Look at the solar winds. How long was the solar winds? That was solar winds with months uh, that existed out there. Well, if you don't have that proper identification, if you're, you don't have that visibility, right? That, that visibility does not exist in, in for identification, and then you cannot protect what you can't see. And that's really what is common across cybersecurity frameworks. doesn't matter if you understand all the little simple steps or the complex step. Identify, identify uh, uh, is uh, the first step, visibility, first step. So this is from a real conversation. I had a little fun with that. Um, I don't see him on the list today, so it's good. So um, uh, I don't think I'm giving out any any embarrassing conversation. But it was with a, a, a CFO, and I don't see his company on the list either. So I talked to some of the other guys, CFOs here. <laughs> but uh, this was a very real conversation that I had with a C-suite of manufacturer, in no way related to anyone that's that's watching now, or maybe later. But he would recognize himself if he saw it and, and actually have a good laugh. Um, 
and I got to admit, even I had this mindset previously. I right? CIO, global uh, company uh, in the, the consumer products, we manufacturing, distribution, retail, healthcare, all this stuff. And I, I had this uh, recently. And you go out to the facility floor and you see these I always call them, and he called them the big green boxes, right? And the guys here in the OT space, Jim, Jim and I go back at it every once in a while and I call them boxes. He's like, Jim, they're enclosures. <laughs> They're enclosures, right? But I didn't want to open those boxes. I had enough to deal with. I wasn't going to open those boxes. I opened those boxes. I bumped something wrong. Man, those, may, you know, engineers and the guys running the plant, whatever it is, they're going to come down on me. So I stayed away, right? For fear of disrupting that production. Uh, so I didn't know I was inside. It took me years before I did that. You know, we're doing all these other enterprise systems and spending millions of dollars. And I, you know, it was years before I opened up that box that it see what was inside and as you from a cfo perspective that's happening too right so you know i i'm willing to admit and say i'm still you know a little, little uh, long in a tooth gray in a hair and i can still learn and you know i i'm learning with some of the other c-suites out there and this is a guy that had worked in a manufacturing operation and when it when i finally got through that conversation he's like oh my goodness he's like well who's watching that right who is watching that so I'm having so many of these discussions. I mean, it is really, truly amazing. And, and, it, and it started, you know, from with myself. You know, I, I, I get it. I understand why we haven't looked. I understand why we don't look. And now that I know, I'm going, there's a gap there. We, we, we really need to address it as an industry. Okay. So those boxes in that picture that are closed. And you, depending on your, your operation and your facility, and we're just using sort of a standard image here, but those boxes are they controlling your lines and your fillers and your, your mixers and, you know, your intrusers or whatever, what, all those other equipment that's, that's running out there. So what is that count? You know, how many are even out there? And, and then off to the right there, you, you've got the SCADA systems and PLCs. And, well, what are they? Why aren't we keeping track of them? We can't, I mean, give me an inventory right now. You know, they're all connected. Um, they're all over. So, <clears throat> pardon me. And, um, but, oh, we're on the next slide. I think Luray's giving me a signal. Oh. There we <laughs> no, no, that's all right. That's all right. No, I just want to, I, I, on the previous one, just, it, they're different. We'll go into this. We can cover it here. So, I call, uh, go ahead to the next one. We'll make everybody busy. I call this slide, right? The what's in the box slide. There's another one. I, I mean, you guys know me, so. Uh, feel free to drop in the chat where that came from. You know what movie that reference that came from. But um, this is the big disconnect slide. All right. So if you are a manufacturing leader and you, you're going, man, this cybersecurity, I just want to know what's going on. You print this slide out and go, are we doing the same thing here as we are here when it comes to industrial security? Are we taking the same steps? Right. Because what we have to remember is that. It, it, it's an enterprise versus industrial network. They're different. They're different. So we say we're doing all these things around enterprise security. Well, the, the differentiators are its outcome focus, right? The, 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 the enterprise security side, well, I'm worried about these digital outcomes. Are we protecting data? Is it are the email going through? Or is it, can we access it? Well, what are they focused on the industrial side? They're not focused on the security. They're, they're focused on the physical outcome. How many units are we producing in that? or day or hour or whatever that might be. So just they're diametrically different. Their, their top goals are different. Uh, the networks are different. If the, if the networks aren't different, then whoa, but we got, you're, you're starting in step zero. You're not even in step one now. Um, and the one thing is kind of, oh, no, we're just a second. Uh, Ray, I just want to finish this slide. Um, the, the security, the risk is increasing on both of them, but we don't know who the security owners are on the left or the right in the industrial side. We don't know who this uh, visibility level is on the right side, on, on the industrial side. So this is the ITOT divide. It's real, it's at risk. Uh, so like, as I said, feel free to take this slide, put it in front of leadership and ask that question. Are we doing the same thing? You don't wanna be the I didn't know guy. All right, so um, I'm gonna pause for a moment, look at this list. We got Netflix on one and we've got vending machines. We've got the uh, Honda, Garmin, a few others. What's that? Feel free to put it in the chat. But the difference here is it's outside versus inside threats. 
And we call them inside threats, but it, what's inside threat? Accidental. And accidental is a threat, right? Um, on, on the intent, all those companies, those big name manufacturers make products in different industries. That's, that's what's just in 2020. It's significantly impacted in 2020. And on the right, we've got stories. These simple things have shut down production. IT scanning, patching, vending. I mean, the vending machine, right? Netflix. Somebody watching Netflix on the floor. So all these things can cause similar issues. We've seen it, right? My question is, without visibility, will you see it? Will you even know what's going on? And everything on the right and under accidental, if you don't have visibility, is usually chalked up to what our uh, CTO here, Dino, usually calls the ghost in the machine. This stuff's probably going on all day long and something wrong with one machine on one line and causing delays. Well, once you figure it out, you know, it, and maybe it was just, let's chalk it up to ghost in the machine. So go on to the next slide. What's at stake? Whether it is these, the, the, the uh, external threats that are coming in, the outside threats that we covered on there, you're becoming a target or it says inside threats, as simple as those little basic things are that are happening every day, um, it, it, it's disruption. And disruption is costly. And it not only costs money, but it can be costly in other ways, human injury, environmental, God forbid if they, they, somebody gets hurt or something's released into the environment. But what it comes down to and why it's so different is these are digital systems producing physical outcomes. And that's why we call it digital safety. That's why we practice digital safety. It's not just about cybersecurity and protecting some electronic files somewhere. We have to be very conscious about that physical outcome. Those machines are controlling some these digital systems are controlling machines, controlling physical outcomes. And we need to be just as concerned about safety on that floor as we need to do about cybersecurity when we bring all this together. So I would ask as business leaders, do you know what that value is, the value of what's at stake, right? And then if that number and what's at stake for you, are you practicing even that first rule? So if, if that's a, a very significant number for your business that you have at stake, are you even practicing that first rule across the board? And that's the, that would be the question and the takeaway from that slide. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, as I said, I, I, I admit, I, I didn't used to know these things, right? And I just used to worry about the enterprise assets up there on the top. Um, just the digital outcomes, you know, the most physical thing was that, you know, print a printout, well, paper can be easily protected or destroyed, right? But you take a look at this chart and there are now so many types of connected assets that control physical outcomes that there are new ones, and there's new ones added every day constantly, right? And, and I, I'll also include IoT devices. Uh, I, I joke, uh, my son's on here somewhere probably listening. We were chatting about this once, and we called uh, we called the uh, OT devices the OG of IoT, right? They're the old guard of IoT. They were the original original IoT because they're cousins of OT. They're, they're very similar, and they have this similar impact into this connected environment and when it comes to cybersecurity, safety, and protection, controlling physical outcomes. And they're, they're, they're cousins of OA, uh, OT, so they're actually handled in a very similar way. They're the same thing. So with that, I, I, I want to, um, again, throw it over to Jim for, uh, I'm sure he's got some additional comments because he's been living this world for decades. He's, he's seen <laughs> what I haven't seen uh, till the past couple of years. Yeah, I appreciate it, Jim. And also as a reminder, guys, if you guys have any questions or anything you want us to address at the end, don't uh, hesitate to type it over in the chat. But, you know, this this coming from my background on the OT side, as well as, as experience kind of teaching the Cisco guys how to have some of these conversations, this has been a real shocker for people. Uh, people don't realize how many devices are Ethernet enabled now on the plant floor. And as Jim said, you know, OT devices, IOT devices, companies tend to be shocked. And when you open that, that box, his, his thought process around the what's in the box scenario, you know, I showed him some pictures and he's like, holy crap, there's like oh, 25 different assets just in this one enclosure, you know? So 
And when you look at what's at stake, that was actually a great slide. Um, you know, things like the unsecured down or the unscheduled downtime, process integrity, human injury. This is not a conversation around cybersecurity anymore. This truly is a conversation around digital safety and how it's now everyone's responsibility versus just an IT or just an OT or, or just a specific group. And that, that makes things really interesting when you have these conversations because it's no longer one person. And people are trying to figure out who ultimately is taking that responsibility. But it comes down to when you have that 15 to 1 ratio, that lack of visibility of all these industrial assets, how do you protect what you don't even know or have visibility on? That's really huge. And a lot of these, these manufacturing environments, these machines have been sitting out there for 20 plus years. And People walk by them every day and never think about what's in them or, or how that might change a threat surface or what internal things might happen to the environment. I mean, Jim mentioned it before, our CTO and founder, he, he who has you know over 40 years of experience in the industrial space as well, he and I have these conversations all the time around as people are doing digital transformation or industry 4.0, they're connecting all these assets and they're doing it so fast that a lot of times there isn't necessarily a, a thought or a methodology around the security as well as the safety side of things. So it's it's really interesting when we talk about this 15 to 1 ratio, it tends to really be an eye opener for the C-suite or um, the key decision makers because they had no idea around how do I have programs that give me that visibility so I can look at things enterprise wide. Yep, thanks, Jim. Yeah, I, I just want to add, those guys have had the conversation, they lived there for decades, and I, I'm, as I said, hey, I'm not too proud to say I, I, I don't know everything. I, I'm learning some of this stuff, and in, in, in they're educating me on which why I'm so, uh, I think, uh, I get so excited about this stuff because it, it, it was an eye-opener for me. Yeah, I thought I'd seen everything in my career, and you get into this, and you're like, holy cow, this stuff is happening. It's happening now. So, this slide here is, uh, I like to call the Velta Mythbusters, right? Um, and these are the big ones. These are common. You hear them all the time. We hear them every day, whether we're talking to uh, uh, directly with clients or we're talking to potential partner organizations or even when we're talking to cybersecurity firms, right? They, they offer cybersecurity. They tell us these things. So we're, it, it, yeah, yeah, first one, air cap, there's no internet. Um, those things that they likely are not are... are, are those think that I should rephrase those that think that they are and say, yes, we're air gap are very likely not. We have not found a case where that that when they said that they were not or that they were air gap, that they weren't. We always found something connected, whether it was in the back end or the front end. And either way, it should be monitored to be proved. If it's critical enough to go, we're air gap, don't worry about it. Well, then if it's, it should be critical enough to be able to prove that you're air gap and you should be watching it if it's that critical. And Because we, we deal with not only in industrial environments, utilities and uh, your critical infrastructure. So those, those are the same same uh, issues exist in critical infrastructure. It does in manufacturing. Firewall is sufficient here all the time, all the time. Right. We got we, we have a firewall. That's firewall. That's how we protect it. Well, those assets, it's different. The assets on the industrial side, they don't have endpoint protection. Um, and then now, given you know the COVID year that keeps on giving, there's there's more uh, remote access, there's more outside partner access, it makes it more critical. And plus, recently there's there's been uh, just the other day another firewall flaw, another vendor. So there's been multiple in the last quarter of those firewalls that have the flaw in it of itself. So. It, it, that's something to always think about. Firewall is not sufficient. Uh, my security plan covers it. You know, most only cover the enterprise. Um, they just assume the industrial somebody else's responsibility. Um, our our security our, uh, uh, practices. So our enterprise. No, what we're doing is sufficient. Fundamentals. The, there's three basic fundamentals. Uh, it was scans and endpoint protection, patches, update, uh, patches and updates. That conflicts, that can cause more harm than it can to protect. And those are basic fundamentals of enterprise security. So that, that, that causes more problem. And then obviously we're not a target. We talked about that. Hopefully yeah, that message came through. All right, so we'll go on to um, 
one of my other favorite, not so favorite slides. Uh, don't try and read all those things around the circle. Those are uh, it's cybersecurity. <laughs> And I, I can speak firsthand, and I say that this is overwhelming for CIOs and CISOs, so can I can only imagine what it's like for the C-suite or manufacturing leaders that are trying to sort out, well, geez, what next? All I hear about is threats, threats, threats. There's this, and the next thing I know, I hear, I, I, I'm hearing zero trust, and is that going to fix us? What's the, I thought we paid. Uh, it's crazy. It really is. I mean, I, I don't know how a business leader, well, I do know how a business leader should sort through, but you can ask, how are you supposed to sort through all this stuff, right? There's just so much noise. You know, what's the difference between the frameworks and strategy and tools and software and hardware that's out there that's supposed to protect you? And this isn't even a complete list, right? And no one, there's not one vendor out there that can provide complete coverage at the time. So you can't even go to one and say, okay, completely cover me. You know, they're going to be assembling pieces and parts. And, you know, that, that's the way it is. And manufacturers want to simplify. If you're lean manufacturing, you want to simplify, right? We'll get to that in a minute. But don't worry. Everyone else wants it to simplify, too. So that's, that, that's something to, to keep in mind. Now, Jim? Oh, yeah. What's going on there? Uh, we jumped around. Go ahead, uh, yeah, just a, just a couple things to add to that, uh, Jim. You know, it, it's interesting. We do have the conversation a lot around myths. And, and it's funny because a lot of the myths actually were true 15 years ago, but there's really been a change. You take like AirGap, for example. You know, 15 years ago, AirGap probably was true. But now as companies are looking at doing more things and adding more devices, and digital transformation and industry 4.0 and more devices that are more ethernet enabled it's just not true and as jim said we have these discussions all the time with customers who are like oh we're air gapped we we had a conversation actually with the utility company a couple of weeks ago and they're like well we want to have some visibility to our industrial assets that are sitting out in our utility environments and we're like okay well we can put some solution sets in to give you that visibility and they're like, yeah, but we're, we're air-gapped. You're not going to be able to see that. And as we started diving into this a little bit, we're like, all right, well, can we, can we tie some systems in so we can tie into your email alerts and stuff like that? And they're like, oh, yeah, well, you can just push it through a story. And it goes right through the firewall to our business systems. And it's like, wait a minute. You just said you were air-gapped. So it, it, it's funny, this, this myth around the whole air-gapping concept in the industrial space that when we do do a visibility study type thing, it's very eye-opening for these customers to really understand what does that environment look like so that we can then help them build kind of a, a digital safety journey is what we call it uh, to help customers work through that. So All right. anyway, just wanted to add that piece. Great, thanks, Jim. Uh, uh, great point. Um, okay, so I'm getting the um, uh, watch my time signal from the in the background. <laughs> And uh, I will I will be uh, as as brief as I can and uh, keep the outside comments coming in. Uh, so this one in the last ten years, every manufacturer I've talked and said we're lean, we're lean, we're lean, right? So how are you supposed to address this if you're not a Fortune 200 company with scale, right? How do you even attempt to address it? Um, your your skills, you're a lean manufacturer. Your skills and resources are focused on production and customer experience, not cybersecurity. Right. That's what you should have your focus on. Well, organizations are addressing this by moving towards service providers. The industry is creating that to, to answer that. That's why your cybersecurity resources are sitting over on one side. We've got to focus, got to build it up. Um, that's going to allow you to have depth that you're never going to be able to build inside of your own organization. So leverage those third party specialists and service services to simplify. Make them part of your team. And, and, you know, that's, it's faster. It's faster. It might seem that it's more, it's expensive, but at the same point, you do the math and trying to create it yourself. Um, it, it's, it's a tough way to go alone. And, uh, you know, you got to be continuous. And, and uh, you know, I'll just answer uh, or ask at the end to think about, you know, who are your security partners as you move forward, right? It doesn't fit well to mid-market leading manufacturers. So, Cyber insurance. I got. I got to throw this one out there, um, right? So we get it. Uh, we we got cyber insurance. It's, it's complicated. Uh, we got that, but we let you what you think, right? And this is not only from those that I've talked to that are affected, 
but it's also with our relationship directly with insurance industry itself. These are, are just common. When, when someone goes around and takes a real deep look at their cyber insurance, it's going to be painful when you try and figure out and you, you actually have to put a claim in. And then guess what? If your business disruption, that's not even covered under cyber insurance. Even if you're hacked, it doesn't matter. Um, it, it's going to draw on your, your, your commercial property, right? And the one thing that even the industry guys say, even when I'm talking directly with the, uh, um, the insurance industry, they say, well, well, how are you trying to mitigate it? Well, it's their insurance industry. You just raise the rates. They're not mitigating it. They're just raising the rates. That's how they're offsetting it. They're not making movements because we've tried to, we're trying to force and say, there should be a standard. There should be common practices. This is what we should be doing. So what do you need to do? You need to manage cyber risk as risk as business risk right risk management and and, and cyber security they are business man and part of your business risk program um, and then think about these things to go can we reduce exposure to drive down premiums can we leverage all these uh active measures that we're doing to actually negotiate lower premiums um because uh, as your budget increases because of an impact you're going to pay now or you're going to pay later um, and say, you know, and meet some of those common practices. Uh, so you, you need to know your risk in order to mitigate your risk. Basic uh, risk management and visibility is key. So <clears throat> one of my uh, uh, personal favorites, uh, uh, the digital risk is a business responsibility. Um, <clears throat> it, it, you know, you're a, big, a, a digital business, uh, rapid remote, we moved, COVID rush, work from home. Uh, there's industry 4.0, now there's smart, smart factories. Uh, we're connecting into existing legacy devices. Um, and, and you go, well, uh, that's that's IT's problem. Well, no, you know, business leaders, I did, what's a digital traffic cop? Well, technology solutions are being purchased all over the organization, marketing, sales, operation. Well, IT's busy, so let's let the business get what it needs. But those business leaders, they're the center of decisions, approvals, authorizations, and that technology spend, contract negotiations, reviews, terms, extensions of pricing, all these things rolled into one. Digital responsibility is business and IT together, right? You've got to create that, start that journey and keep moving forward. And you have to formalize that approach, that leadership responsibility that I'm preaching. You've got to be risk aware. You've got to put a governance approach, the cybersecurity edition, roll it in there. It's a business risk. Yeah, I think I, you know to to add to add to that, Jim. I think I would I would say you know, how, again, you keep hearing us say this. How do you manage risk if you don't have visibility? That's that's huge. You know, we're we're seeing more and more customers as we have these enterprise wide conversations that this is extremely important to the business, and and there's really a business convergence that's happening because of this whole digital safety type of conversation. You know, really, the, where we're seeing companies have the best success is when those business teams are working together to create risk governance teams that include your manufacturing environment, your legal teams, your IT teams. Again, in the past where something like cybersecurity might have been driven by one team, this is more, this is, this is a very different animal. And one of the things that we've also found is you know, don't go don't go at this alone. It, it really is important to take somebody that has that IT and that OT experience to maybe share some of the what we would have called best practices that are now becoming common practices, right? Common practices in the IT space need to also now become common practices in the OT space uh, before you even look at the whole what is considered best practice. Sorry, Jim. No, that's all right. Great point. Great segue. Uh, big finish. Big finish. Uh, so let's review, right? I covered a lot. Um, these are the things we know. Target, cybersecurity. You need to see visibility. How do you, how do you operate with a new environment and who's responsible? Let's go on to the big payoff, the common practices that we promised, right? Finally, what we promised, what the top five common practices for business leaders to know. You know number one, react and learn. What can we learn from this? We need to make sure we address it. <laughs> Let's go. Are there signals out there? Two, visibility. Protect what you, you can't protect what you can't see. Three, 
business leaders need to be involved. This is digital responsibility. It's a business need to be involved in organizing. Number four, outside experts make business sense, right? Yeah, you're, you're focused on production and what you do and your customer, you're not a cybersecurity company. Let's recognize that and take advantage of the experts that are out there. Number five, ongoing part of the business plan. It just needs to be part of the business plan. It's just, it's the life we live today, right? And since we're such great guys, I threw a bonus in and that's turn on MFA. If you're using multi-factor authentication, uh, you probably need to move that sucker to the top of your list. All right. So if you haven't already, drop some questions in the chat. Uh, remember, we are open to direct discussions with clients and partners. Jim is going to give you, you know, we put out a, a lot of problems here. He's going to say, well, how can we help? Right. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. You know, this is complicated and we and we get that. Um, we, we've figured out a lot of this just based on a lot of the different conversations with uh, a lot of the different players as well as the different customers. You know, when, when we talk about cybersecurity Part of the challenge is, is it means different things to different people and who you talk to. Um, a lot of times it kind of becomes that boil the ocean mentality. So people kind of get that process or paralysis by analysis. So they kind of stick their head in the sand a little bit. Um, but what we've really tried to do is we've created kind of our digital safety journey to kind of help customers connect those dots. And, and our methodology allows it to break those steps down so that the customer can execute on things that are more manageable and really take away the mystique around the boil the ocean type of approach. Um, our methodology and our solution offering allow us to simplify that solution or journey. Um, a lot of times we'll talk to customers around the, hey, an in-the-box solution or how can we help you get safer sooner? How can we help by helping or having you guys just hit the easy button by reaching out to us and we can help lay out what does that digital safety journey look like for you guys. Um, when you look at some of the things that, that we found offering to our customers that help break this piece down is, you know, visibility study programs. You've heard us talk a lot around the visibility approach. How can you possibly put together a small little low cost, low risk solution that provides that visibility so that you can develop a strategy moving forward um, continuous monitoring solutions that have the hardware and the software all in one environment, managed service programs. How do you take all the data coming from these different things and operationalize that data so that it's part of the data sets that you're already looking at to make better business decisions? We found that that's really critical uh, as customers look at some of this stuff is data is constantly coming from all these directions. How can you have access to people like on the OT side and the, and the IT side to help operationalize that data. Um, how do you do things like secure remote access with audit trail? That's the big one. People have been doing secure remote access for a long time. The audit trail piece is something that's becoming more and more critical. So, you know, we had the solutions and the expertise and the subject matter experts that, that will allow the customers to take that first step now. And you can see here, take that first step now and be safe in less than 30 days. We say that because the first piece of that digital safety journey is visibility. And we can always go over what the other steps are in, in future conversations. But, you know, assessments, visibility programs help you know what the risks are so that you can get so, uh, safer sooner. So we do have programs that you guys can execute on right now uh, that are low risk and, and also low cost because as you guys move forward with the digital safety journey, that visibility study will actually help you execute those strategies even more efficiently. So Ray, if you go to the next slide for me. Yeah, um, just to, I wanna add real oh, quick uh, what yeah, you were saying. That the, 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 yeah, that's, if take a look. How do you know what you've got if you don't take that first step of the visibility? So if you're fine, great. You looked, you're good, you move on. Uh, you got to open up, you got to look in that box and say, what do we really have? Because it, it, you're not, it's not happening right now. Um, I also want to just uh, give a shout out to, or, or never mind, go ahead. 
uh, finish. Sorry, and then we'll get. Yeah, no, no, no worries. I just, I just wanted to make sure. Are there any questions and stuff like that? And that, that again, we threw a lot of data out. Really, the action item I want from the teams that are on the call is uh, feel free to reach out to us. We can really kind of do some deeper dive conversations around your particular solution sets. Um, we work with a lot of the OT system integrators as well. Um, because they're very good about putting the whole solution together. We are very laser focused in that, that IT, OT, cybersecurity, digital safety space. So we will work a lot with the system integrators to offer that, that bundle of solution sets that help round out the value that they're providing. We also work a lot with some of the IT partners as well because they're very good at offering what they do we can offer some of these solution sets to really help round out the value they can provide uh, to their customers as well. So right. yeah. we, we did have a couple um, questions that have come in <clears throat> when someone's asking, like, you know, what does it cost? I mean, again, about like, you know, how much should a company be spending on security? Um, and then what about the ROI? I think those are two related questions, how to, how to look at the ROI for an investment. Great. Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and, and just uh, quickly address, right? Uh, the cost is always, it's, it's a, a malleable thing, right? You're going to go, oh, well, geez, how much is it going to cost? They're going to cost a lot. Well, um, we've seen a lot different. The, you know, it depends on how much, right? How much is at risk? How much do you spend in your whole security environment? That It's still, the, the jury's out, right? Ranges vary, your risks vary, uh, businesses are different. You know, are you an average spender versus results? Um, uh, you know, but we've seen some reports that go, hey, 10 to 20 percent of your IT spend, you know, and that's even if your IT spend is right. And then but what, one of the things we do know is it's increasing, right? Two thirds of our planning annual increases. So you really need to think about are you spending to protect the right things in your business? Right. And um, there's some, you know, there's some. Uh, well, I, I should say, dare say snake oil stuff out there that. Uh, uh, is being sold. Um, but where are the fundamentals? I want to give this is where I want to give the shout out to uh, uh, one of my uh, cybersecurity colleagues that I respect uh, out there that it had put out in the text, right? Uh, I'm going to read this, right? Uh, getting back to the basics in IT is key fundamental and does not take a big budget to do. Everyone wants the next fancy solution that solves all IT needs, but that tends to be complicated and set up. And I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Ross, for that. That was a great comment. Um, and that, that Ross doesn't work for Velta here. He's just a former colleague and, and uh, uh, a good guy that I respect and been living in cybersecurity world for quite some time. So it, it varies from our solutions. You know, if you were asking specifically, it, it depends on the size. I mean, it's just with anything, right? But we are focused on making um, a value statement for mid-market manufacturers and have the conversation. So it's not out of reach of mid-market. It's not overwhelming. Um, would you put a guard outside of your facility if you thought that that was going to protect it? And you need to think about from the ROI side, well, what's your, you, you know, what is the ROI? Well, what's the risk reduction, as I said, right? How much are you putting at risk? What's at stake? Are you spending the right money on the right things, protecting the critical assets, the critical processes, and then also think, how do you reduce unplanned shutdowns, right? Unplanned, unscheduled shutdowns, that's worse than money in the manufacturing world. Uh, you, you know, whether by equipment or lines or facility disruption, what are those costs? Those are right now are hidden. They're hidden in a budget, right? You do a budget, you're probably doing, well, 95% efficiency. We're planning uh, five weeks of unscheduled disruptions for the year. And you don't know what that cost is. You just kind of take it out. But what if you could take? half of those out. What's the value there? So I uh, really think about it. I think it's within reach. It's a, you know, I don't want to dodge the question and just say, here's a dollar amount, but uh, uh, it's within reach. And it's usually relative to, you know, how big that organization is, what they're producing and, and, and what's at risk. Here's a more tactical question. So with the COVID stuff that's still going on and, um, you know, and kind of a question around, you know, these are two related questions like do you need access to our plant floor equipment or do we do this ourselves like kind of what's required uh and then um also kind of related like how do i ensure it doesn't uh do anything to my current operation and right. well, uh, I'll, I'll open and i'm going to hand off to jim because he lives in the world right so 
uh, you take it from the IT perspective and I'll pass it over to Jim. I'll try and be brief. Um, it, it's basically a, a an appliance that goes in in your industrial network and it, it differs depending. It can go all the way on your floor. It depends on how your industrial networks. We haven't seen this, an industrial network that looks like another one. So it, it has to go out there. It sits in that network where all those uh, devices are. It's a listen only first. Listen only, it's passive mode. It is not going to cause disruption. That's what we talked about digital safety. That's where we come from. That's why it's different. That's why it's not IT based. It goes out there and scans everything. You scan, you can shut things down and disrupt. So that uh, we put something out there, it listens, and now it's taking inventory and it's it's understanding what the vulnerabilities and the statuses and it gives you device profiles and 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 actually constantly monitoring like an IDS system for threats and the com portals for your machines talking to machines. So Jim, I'll just quickly pass yeah. it to you. you want to yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, so I want to hit on a few things you mentioned there, Jim, because that's really important because we have had a lot of conversations with different companies. Uh, who are like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to take my IT tool out there and scan the network, and then all of a sudden things start dropping off, right? So uh, a lot of the solution sets that we offer are done in a passive mode. So as Jim said, you know, not only are they done in a passive mode, but they've been designed to understand all those industrial protocols that are sitting out there, because that's another thing that's really important. You need to understand what devices are talking to what devices in native protocols versus just kind of doing a, oh, well, yeah, I'm just going to do a quick capture of what's going on. And a lot of times that deep packet inspection of those protocol, those industrial protocols is not being captured. Um, back to the question around the access to systems. I, I want to be careful how I answer that. Yes, we do need access to the systems, but not to do anything uh, evasive to the systems. What we do is we like to come out because a lot of times the appliance that Jim was talking about, if someone said, especially in COVID, hey, can you just send us the appliance and we'll put it in the right spot and you're talking to the wrong individual, they end up putting it in the wrong spot of their industrial enterprise infrastructure. So a lot of times the, the best practice is for us to be able to come on site if possible and do what we call a Gemba walk where we would actually walk the environment and understand kind of how the environment is set up on the plant floor side so that we can make sure that as we put these tool sets in, they're getting in the right spots to create the visibility. And then when we do those visibility study programs, one of the outcomes that comes out of that is that digital safety summary report. So you'd actually get a report that can be shared across all the key decision makers that give you a state of, here's what we're seeing, here's what's going on, and weekly calls with those decision makers to be able to go, hey, we're starting to see a, a lot more IT assets on my OT network, or we're starting to see ghost assets popping on and off my network. So we tend to do a lot of those kinds of things. So we need access to the systems, but not necessarily in an invasive way. It's more in that passive way to be able to make sure that the tool sets are in the right place to capture the right value for what the customer is trying to do with their business challenge. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I think yep. uh, uh, Lou Ray, you're uh, you're wrapping up as we hit the yep. hour mark. Yes, thank you, everyone, for joining. We will get a link to the recording for this out to you all, and to connect directly with the folks, uh, obviously, on this call and others that are representing Velta in the background. Um, you can reach out to us at info at veltotech.com or directly to any of the emails you got from Craig yesterday. Um, and we just thank you so much for joining.